next few weeks, a matter of fact, we're going to do chapter 24. Chapter 24, I'm going to read it. I'm going to make a Mishaberach. If you have anyone you want me to make a Mishaberach for. And then it's a fabulous, fabulous chapter. And there's so much to speak about it. I think it'll take me at least another two to three weeks and maybe four weeks to say what I'd like to say in the chapter. And that's only the tip of an iceberg. So let me just read the chapter in Hebrew. This is a famous, very famous chapter. We say a few times a year. Not only that, we say it a few times a week. So this was written by King David. He composed this to be said in the future when the temple will be built by his son, Solomon. And he composes after he brought we'll soon see, he brought a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, Hara Moria, and that is where the temple was built. Okay, so we'll speak about that in a minute, but let me go back about when we say this chapter. It's an interesting thing. The first time we say this chapter, by the way, two nights of Rosh Hashanah after the Amida, we say the two nights of Rosh Hashanah before we conclude the davening and the night of Yom Kippur, we say it. Number one. Number two, we also say it every day, weekday when we return the Torah. We also say it, believe it or not. Number three, it is the song of the day. The song of the day, you know for when? For Sunday, today. Today, Sunday's song of the day was, and this is how we concluded our prayers today, this, this Psalm, Psalm 24. So there must be something special to this Psalm. So that's number one point I want to bring out. Interesting enough, why do we say this the nights of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? the holiest nights of the year. First of all, we say this, imagine after Shemona Esri. What is the Shemona Esri? What did we just do? We just elevated ourselves to be as close as possible to God. That's what Shemona Esri resembles. Shemona Esri every morning is the peak of the davening. So imagine on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the holiest days of the year, we elevated ourselves to have a closeness to Hashem. And what do we pray for right after that closeness, when we reach that closeness? Not for something spiritual, not for something holy, but for Parnassah. If you remember every Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, every year at night, before we open up the ark, we say this paragraph, I say this is a special prayer for Parnasa for sustenance. So we pray for sustenance, for Parnasa for money, on the holiest days of the year. When we reach the, one of the holiest peaks to, peak times in our prayer, closeness, elevation of closeness to God, and what do we pray for? Materialism. Interesting point. Now, let's go a drop further. It says, it's brought down in the Arizal, and it's brought down in many Sfarim, that if this is said with the proper concentration and the proper intent and focus on the nights of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, this is a propition, which in Hebrew it's a skula, it's good luck for sustenance. The Arizal says as follows, that those who say it with the right intent, 
with deep concentration on Rosh Hashanah Kippur night, he says, La es Imagine, it's for sustenance, but it, he doesn't say he's going to win the lottery. It doesn't say whoever says it properly with the proper concentration will become a millionaire. It says he won't be missing anything he needs. In Jewish tradition, our view of being rich is not having to worry about where is the bills going to, where are the bills going to be paid from? Where is my next loaf of bread going to come from? Our view is, Layatsaru, says Arizal. So we should not be missing anything. We should not have the worries of every day. Sustenance, where's the next, you know, bottle of milk going to come from, so to speak. Believe it or not, there are people that unfortunately do have to worry about that. But the Jewish view of riches is, don't worry about that. So we should have more time to be able to spend on Torah, mitzvahs, a little more time in the study hall, a little more time on a Zoom class, a little more time, you know, davening, so we don't have those worries. And that's what Darizal says. If we say with a proper focus and intent, not only that, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, says as follows, and I'm going to blow you all away soon. He says, what is a tremendous gula for parnasa, a propitiation for parnasa, for sustenance? One is saying this paragraph with a proper concentration on the nights of Rosh Hashanah, both nights and Yom Kippur. And that's, by the way, because of such a great prayer in many congregations, we open up the ark. The Torah is open then. And many people have a supplication underneath after they finish, before we finish off with Kaddish, there's a prayer for Parnassah, a separate prayer for that. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you ready for this? To have, and this is our custom in Chabad, and this is a custom by many Hasidim, and this is not only a custom by many Hasidim, when I was in Yeshiva in high school, Many of us were invited to teachers' houses, Motsoy Yom Kippur, the night after Yom Kippur, to have a lavish meal. It's brought down, if we have a lavish meal, meaning we wash and we have a flesh a meal, a meat meal, on Motsoy Yom Kippur, in other words, a Yom Tov meal, on Motsoy Yom Kippur, after Yom Kippur, that is also a propitiation, a uh, segula, good luck for Parnassa. So Richie is trying to figure out why that, right? Richie's look is like, he's a little puzzled because it says, Matsayam Kippur, we have to leave the shul in a holiday spirit with the mindset that we are going to have a great year. We, we have to have the mindset that we were already sealed into a great year and that it's, we're in holiday mode already because four days later is Sukkot. So that's why that is a very auspicious time at Sayyam Kippur. We were victorious and we're going to have a healthy year, a great year and have the right set of mind and go into the next four days of in holiday mode, not only Matzah Yom Kippur, the next four days we got to be in a joyous mode because we have Sukkot and Sukkot Torah coming up. So that's as far as why we say it then. Now, if you remember, I told you that this was said by King David in preparation for his son Solomon. When he builds a temple, that when they bring the ark, the Aaron, the ark, into the Holy of Holies, they should say this paragraph. They should say this paragraph when they bring it into the Holy of Holies. And that's why, my friends, on the weekdays when we take the Torah back and put it back into the ark, what paragraph do we say? This paragraph. Because of that. 
where King David's whole intention was to use this paragraph to say it should be recited when the Jews will bring the ark into the Holy of Holies, when King Solomon builds the temple. Remember, David, King David prepared everything for King Solomon, for his son, to prepare everything. So think about it like this. So what we are doing is, when on the weekdays, when we return the Torah into the ark, the holiest thing we have, the Torah, what are we doing? We're saying this same paragraph. So that's why we say it Rosh Hashanah night, Yom Kippur night, and also when on the fact that when we return the Torah. Now why do we say it Sunday? Why was this chosen for Sunday morning? Very simple, if we think about it. When do we first say this paragraph? Rosh Hashanah time. At the beginning of the world. The beginning of creation. Wait a minute. What's Sunday? The first day of the week. It's the creation of the week. It's the week becoming all brand new. And this is God creating the world again, as we say. God creates the world every single day. But this is the beginning of the week. So just like we said it at the beginning of the world, we say it at the beginning of the week. Now I'll tell you something very interesting. Where did King David say this? Mount Moriah, Hara Moria. What did he do then? He brought a korban, a sacrifice, which was called, we learned this in the Talmud class, in Chagiga, a korban ola. Remember we learned about the olas ri'ia, the sacrifice he had to bring to be seen on the holiday. A olas ri'ia, the ola was the sacrifice that went completely to God. It got completely burned up. So what was so special about Har HaMoriah, that he, Har HaMoriah, the Mount Moriah, that he had to bring it over there? Very simple, that he said it over there. First of all, he was the first Jew, remember, he was the first full-fledged Jew that brought a sacrifice on Har HaMoriah. What do you mean, Rabbi? I'll tell you what I mean, Rabbi. Let's go back. Who was the first man on earth? Adam. Good, Richie, just a test. Adam. How did God, what does tradition say? How did God form Adam from the dust of the earth? Where did he take this dust from? Mount Moriah. God took the dust from Mount Moriah. Adam had two sons. Remember, we're talking about Jews. Adam wasn't a Jew. Who was the first Jew? Abraham. Let's remember that. Now, let's go back to Adam. Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel. They brought two sacrifices. They each brought a sacrifice for God. Where did they bring their sacrifice? Mount Moriah. Good, you're getting it, Richie, you're catching on. We have <laughs> later on in the Torah, what do we have? We have an incident where God comes to Abraham and tells Abraham, Kach es bincha es yichitcha asher ahavta es yitzchak Take your son, your only son that you love, your son Isaac, and take him for a binding. Sacrifice him to me. Right? Where did he do this? Where was he told to do this? Very good, Peter. I'm proud of you. And now, King David was told by Nasan Anabi, by Nathan the prophet, King David was told that the place where God's temple is going to be, is going to be called in the city called Sholem, not Yerushalayim, Sholem. We'll speak about how the city became Yerushalayim maybe next week. 
And where's the temple going to be? Here on Mount Moriah. So we see how important Mount Moriah was and the importance. Now let me ask you a question. King David, his whole dream was the temple. Not only was his whole dream the temple, his whole he made the plans. He planned it out. He set the Psalms to be sang. He did it all. And yet, and yet, God said, uh, 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 you ain't doing it. You're not doing it. You're not going to be the builder. Who's going to put it together? Your son, Shlomo. Why Shlomo? Why King Solomon? Very simple. David was not able to do it. Spiritually wise, because we're talking about the holiest place. And David was a man of war. David, as holy as King David was, he was still a warrior. He still was a man of war. He was not able to build the temple. He was able to make the plans and set everything up. And his son, who was not the man of war, who was more of a man of peace, he was the one to bring the to build the temple. Who? How do we know his son, David's son Shlomo, was a man of peace? Just from his name alone. Shlomo is Shalom. Shalom is peace. So we see that from the name. I'm trying to put like a puzzle together for you a little bit. Okay? So that's as far as that's concerned. If you look at chapter 24, it starts off, if you have a Tillam in front of you, it starts off with the word, Lidavid Mizmor. Right? To David, right? To David, there was a song. That's very nice. Look back at, if you look back at chapter 23, that's chapter 24. If you look back at chapter 23, right? What are the first two words in chapter 23? Very famous chapter. We say at funerals, we say Shabbos, Mizmar le David, just the opposite. 23 is Mizmor le David, a song by David. 24 is le David Mizmor, same two words, just turned around. Why the change? And we'll conclude with this today, and then this is just the intro, and then next week we'll continue and get into the chapter itself. There were two times that David sang the Tillam. One was he sang a song and he became inspired. One was he was inspired and he sang a song. One brought the inspiration. One, the inspiration elevated him to sing a song. Whenever you have the phrase, Mizmar le David, like in 23, a song by David, that is, our rabbis tell us, David sang the song and became inspired. In other words, he begged for the inspiration and he got it. Whenever you have le David Mizmar, that David's name is coming first, that is already when he's been inspired and he used that inspiration to a greater level of godliness. So when he sang this psalm, this was already when he was inspired, and he used it to reach a greater level of godliness. And my friends, conclude with the saying is, that's why on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we don't say Mizmor le David, we say le David Mizmor, chapter 24. Because we are so inspired on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur nights, the holiest nights, we just finished that elevation of closest to God, which was the Amida. Now we're so inspired. Now we're ready to say Le David Mizmar to reach a higher level of inspiration. Have a wonderful day. We will continue in Mietz Hashem next week.
Be well, stay safe, everyone.